for doctors, nurses, and medical students, communication is always going to be key. And today's lecture is going to really discuss not just how to communicate with the media, just in case you were asked to um, speak to a reporter or do a television interview, but this is also going to help if you have certain difficult situations in communicating to family members, a patient, or even um, your colleagues, or if you're presenting to a board of directors. Now, in medicine, we're, and really in life in general, you, you, the two hardest types of communication, I, I find there's really basically two totally opposite situations. On the one hand, there are situations when people are upset, they're worried, they're scared, <clears throat> They may have something wrong with their health. It might be a family member. And you know, when you're worried or if you're scared, you're going to be um, maybe a little angry. You might be not trusting. You may not want to listen, or it may be just plain hard to listen. And those situations, you, you really, as a communicator, you have to realize when you're in one of those situations, when you're dealing with somebody who's worried, scared, upset, maybe they're going to turn into someone who's angry. We're often trying to calm people down and speak to them so they can actually understand what we're saying because if you're upset or angry it's very hard to understand something complicated and we find that all the time in medicine then often in the healthcare field we find ourselves in the opposite situation we're dealing with people who are apathetic they could care less uh, you know you try to talk to somebody who you'd like to have them stop smoking or lose weight or exercise more or you want to alert them to something like uh, there's a concern in the community and they need to take precautions. Often people will think, you know, this is not, you know, something they're interested in when they really should be. And you can see how that's a totally different type of communication. And trying to get your point across there can be rather difficult too. Um, as this shows, we can often be misunderstood. And you can see you can get off on the wrong foot here. You know, if somebody's going to uh, communicate clearly, you may not realize that you could be uh, headed, headed into trouble way before you know it. So this is a lecture on media and risk communication. So yes, this will go through how to do a television, newspaper, or radio interview. And of course, this is always headed towards the internet and being out there for everyone to read and be out there for a long time. So you want to do a really good job when dealing with the media. And I'll explain why that's very advantageous. But this is also called risk communication because it's those two examples I mentioned before. You know, when somebody's worried or... For doctors, nurses, and medical students, communication... Is For doctors, nurses, and medical students, communication is always going to be key. And today's lecture is going to really discuss not just how to communicate with the media, just in case you were asked to um, speak to a reporter or do a television interview, but this is also going to help if you have certain difficult situations in communicating to family members, a patient, or even um, your colleagues, or if you're presenting to a board of directors. Now, in medicine, we're, and really in life in general, you, you, the two hardest types of communication, I, I find there's really basically two totally opposite situations. On the one hand, there are situations when people are upset, they're worried, they're scared, <clears throat> they may have something wrong with their health, it might be a family member. And you know, when you're worried or if you're scared, you're going to be um, maybe a little angry. You might be not trusting. You may not want to listen, or it may be just plain hard to listen. And those situations, you, you really, as a communicator, you have to realize when you're in one of those situations. When you're dealing with somebody who's worried, scared, upset, maybe they're going to turn into someone who's angry. We're often trying to calm people down and speak to them so they can actually understand what we're saying. Because if you're upset or angry, it's very hard to understand something complicated. And we find that all the time in medicine. Then, often in the healthcare field, we find ourselves in the opposite situation. 
we're dealing with people who are apathetic. They could care less. Uh, you know, you try to talk to somebody who you'd like to have them stop smoking or lose weight or exercise more. Or you want to alert them to something like uh, there's a concern in the community and they need to take precautions. Often people will think, you know, this is not, you know, something they're interested in when they really should be. And you can see how that's a totally different type of communication. And trying to get your point across there can be rather difficult too. Um, as this shows, we can often be misunderstood. And you can see you can get off on the wrong foot here. You know, if somebody's going to uh, communicate clearly, you may not realize that you could be uh, headed, headed into trouble way before you know it. So this is a, a lecture on media and risk communication. So yes, this will go through how to do a television, newspaper, or radio interview. And of course, this is always headed towards the internet and being out there for everyone to read and be out there for a long time. So you want to do a really good job when dealing with the media. And I'll explain why that's very advantageous. But this is also called risk communication because it's those two examples I mentioned before. You know, when somebody's worried or scared, you as a professional have all your training behind you, but you've got to be able to communicate the risk accurately. Because somebody who's scared or worried, they have a ton of energy. And as you've probably seen, people can use that energy for bad things. <clears throat> they can over worry, they can do things like get angry and, and use that energy for the wrong reasons. You want to communicate the risk in the right way that they can use that energy to help themselves. And then of course, people may not know they're in danger, they may not realize that there's a problem out there and, and it might be with their personal health, it might be out there uh, uh, right now we're dealing with a lot of mosquitoes in Florida and you know we're trying to communicate the risk. Uh, here uh, it's the day after Halloween and we really the last few days we're trying to get people to understand when you go out trick-or-treating you gotta make sure your kids are protected from these mosquitoes that can carry diseases that can cause encephalitis which is a brain swell swelling of the brain. So how do you, you know, communicate that risk and that's why this is called risk communication. Um, I'm going to start off with a video that is, uh, you know, sort of the kind of things we could fall into, and it describes um, a situation at a local hospital. You'll see that the reporters actually were advertising, or the, the, the news station was advertising the story every half hour, almost every commercial from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock about this uh, outbreak of a, of a particular disease and they made it sound pretty scary during the uh, commercials and then when the news broadcast opened up the um, uh, if it gets to play here the the uh, you can tell by the way the reporters are speaking there's a lot of a uh, little bit of tension anxiety and you can see how this sort of plays out so let's see if we can get this to run <coughs> a deadly strain of e coli in lake county Tonight, Eyewitness News discovered a local hospital waited two weeks to report it. Tonight, health officials say they may never know where the E. coli came from, partly because the hospital waited to inform them. Good evening, I'm Marty Salt. And I'm Chris Sager, and for Bob Opsall, Channel 9's Jody Fleischer is live in Lake County with the tales of this latest case and some others. Jody? Well, the health department won't tell us which hospital that Lake County patient visited or what city he lives in. They say that's to protect his privacy. But one family who lived through an almost deadly E. coli scare two years ago says more communication could help limit the infection. So here you see um, a situation where somebody has gotten sick with E. coli and the reporter has not been able to find that person. So they found somebody with the same disease who caught it two years ago. And you can also tell this is not boding very well for the hospital because they're, they're, this is one thing I'll talk about later. This story has a lot of ingredients in it that make it interesting. It, it's the reason why this was the first story for the evening news that night. And it has a little bit of conflict and controversy. And of course now you'll see a video from a victim of the same disease from two years ago. The pain Shannon Smoten felt as her tiny body was ravaged by E. coli bacteria is rivaled only by the pain her parents felt, almost losing their little girl. 
it's difficult to put into words. And when I hear cases that are possibly another E. coli, any kind of E. coli, it just kind of hits me in the pit of my stomach. Especially when Kathy Smoten heard the cause of the latest cases may never be known. The 20-year-old Lake County patient went to the hospital October 31st, but the health department didn't find out about the case until November 17th. By then, it was hard to remember every place he'd eaten or visited. We'd like to get a hold of the patient and the patient's family as soon as possible so that we can start investigating, even when it's a suspected illness. Florida had 67 cases of the potentially deadly strain last year. It's the same one Shannon caught at a traveling petting zoo in 2005. It sickened hundreds of people who ate contaminated spinach or at Taco Bell in the past few months. That's why Lake County requested more tests. Genetic testing isn't usually done to fingerprint the E. coli, but because of the outbreak that's going on in the northeast part of the country, uh, we did it to see if there was a possible link. Turns out these cases were not linked to those, but they were linked to two others in the state. A set of nine-year-old twins in Hernando County had the exact same strain as the Lake County man, but dozens of other cases weren't ever compared. Kathy says they should all be. It's frightening if that's, if that's happening. And the state says oftentimes it doesn't get those samples from the hospital in order to test them, and they say even then genetic matching is not foolproof. Now, the state did talk to the hospital here in Lake County about changing its policy to report suspected cases of E. coli even before they're confirmed. Reporting live in Lake County, Jody Fleischer, Channel 9 Eyewitness News. The O157H7 strain is one of hundreds of strains of E. coli. Most are harmless, but this one produces a powerful toxin. It was first recognized as being harmful in 1982. Since then, undercooked beef containing the strain has caused more infections than any other food. Now, you can go to the health page of WFTV.com and click on the health resources for more detailed information on E. coli, including updates on those current outbreaks. A deadly strain of E. coli in Lake County. Tonight, Eyewitness News discovered a local hospital waited two weeks to report it. Tonight, health officials say they may never know where the E. coli came from, partly because the hospital waited to inform them. Good evening, I'm Marty Salt. And I'm Chris Sager, and for Bob Opsall, Channel 9's Jody Fleischer is live in Lake County with details of this latest case and some others. Jody? Well, the health department won't tell us which hospital that Lake County patient visited or what city he lives in. They say that's to protect his privacy. But one family who lived through an almost deadly E. coli scare two years ago says more communication could help limit the infection. The pain Shannon Smoten felt as her tiny body was ravaged by E. coli bacteria is rivaled only by the pain her parents felt, almost losing their little girl. It's difficult to put into words, and when I hear cases that are possibly another E. coli, any kind of E. coli, it just kind of hits me in the pit of my stomach. Especially when Kathy Smoten heard the cause of the latest cases may never be known. The 20-year-old Lake County patient went to the hospital October 31st, but the health department didn't find out about the case until November 17th. By then, it was hard to remember every place he'd eaten or visited. We'd like to get a hold of the patient and the patient's family as soon as possible so that we can start investigating, even when it's a suspected illness. Florida had 67 cases of the potentially deadly strain last year. It's the same one Shannon caught at a traveling petting zoo in 2005. It sickened hundreds of people who ate contaminated spinach or at Taco Bell in the past few months. That's why Lake County requested more tests. Genetic testing isn't usually done to fingerprint the E. coli, but because of the outbreak that's going on in the northeast part of the country, uh, we did it to see if there was a possible link. Turns out these cases were not linked to those, but they were linked to two others in the state. A set of nine-year-old twins in Hernando County had the exact same strain as the Lake County man, but dozens of other cases weren't ever compared. Kathy says they should all be. It's frightening if that's, if that's happening. And the state says oftentimes it doesn't get those samples from the hospital in order to test them, and they say even then genetic matching is not foolproof. Now, the state did talk to the hospital here in Lake County about changing its policy to report suspected cases of E. coli even before they're confirmed. Reporting live in Lake County, Jody Fleischer, Channel 9 Eyewitness News. The O157H7 strain is one of hundreds of strains of E. coli. Most are harmless, but this one produces a powerful toxin. It was first recognized as being harmful in 1982. Since then, undercooked beef containing the strain has caused more infections than any other food. Now, you can go to the health page of WFTV.com and click on the health resources for more detailed information on E. coli, including updates on those current outbreaks. Well, there's a lot of ingredients in this story uh, that get to how a um, 
story comes to life and who they interview. And as you can see here, the hospital was unnamed. That video you saw was of just a, a, um, an anonymous hospital. Uh, they threw together uh, some expert opinions, and, and you'll see there's some commentary. And you can see that, um, you know, this seemed to, was what was, I guess, what was needed that night for the news. Uh, they have a job to do, put out the news, and that sort of leads me to, well, you know, what actually gets into the news? And obviously the, you know, things people put on the news, it's got to be something new. It's got to be something of interest. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, selling advertising time, and they also want to make the news uh, something that's appealing to the community. But, you know, often it's not what we think is the truth behind a story. It's often what people are feeling about the story. And as you know, that sometimes can be uh, not exactly the... Um, the, the full story. And that gets to the third point, is that almost everything, especially on television news, and you could say for many other forms of mass media, is it's the, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what you and I want. You know, you and I as professionals, as folks who dive into a subject and try to understand it completely because it involves somebody's life, it involves somebody's health, we love the details. We, we live for those details. However, when it comes to mass media, the, the, the folks know that if it takes too long to explain, you're not going to hold the audience's attention. So often stories for the media, they got to be brief and to the point and not take a long time to do, describe. In fact, they have to be almost black and white. It's simple, right or wrong, good or evil. That's what these stories are. And so often when you're trying to communicate your story because you have important things to share, you have to keep that in mind. The, the, you have to sort of fit the ingredients to make sure that your message does get out there. And that's a lot of what today's lecture is. How do you want to get your message out there because you have important things to share? Now I'm going to go through the steps that it takes to get your story out there in the media. And the way I see this is that, you know, a lot of uh, healthcare providers, doctors and nurses and, and others that provide health, you know, we're often doing it one patient at a time. You take care of Mrs. Jones and then you take care of Mr. Smith and that's good. However, I'm going to talk about opportunities to help a thousand people at one time. You're the experts. You have that information. If you could share it not with just one person, but a hundred people, a thousand people, or a million people, you're doing a good service, especially if you're providing accurate, helpful information. So here's the steps that get you down that road. First, you know, you have to be available to meet the needs of the mass media to get your story across. Because remember, you're the expert. You have the, the most helpful information, but you have to be available. Uh, you have to be able to accept the interview properly once you've lined yourself up to be asked to do interviews. <clears throat> Each interview is, is separate, so you have to know how to accept it. You have to get ready for it. And, and when the interview begins, there are certain steps I'm going to let you know about that make it go a little smoother. And then what do you do after the interview? So let's go to the first step. How do you, you know, what does it mean to make yourself available? You may uh, want to introduce yourself to the local folks who do media in the community. Say, uh, <clears throat> you know, you might be an expert in a particular nursing or medical field. You might be a specialist in gastroenterology. And yes, you can contact the local media and say, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a specialist in this area. If you ever have any questions about in my case, it might be uh, public health with uh, influenza, it might be with vaccinations. Uh, you know, say, give me a call. Um, you know, I'll, if I can't answer your questions, I'll try to find somebody who can. So I've made myself available. Let them know that, you know, you're someone that they could turn to and that you'd be available and that you are quickly available because these folks are working just as hard as you are. They have deadlines. If they want to talk with you about something you may know about, if you're not available relatively soon, and sometimes it's a half hour, an hour, maybe a couple hours, they'll just go to somebody else who may not have the information as well as you have it. <clears throat> so you are there because you have information that is something that they're interested in, and it makes it so the community's interested in it. So if they see that connection, they'll be willing to uh, listen to what information you have to offer, or they may be coming to you because they know you have relevant information. Uh, they may know you're the expert, and you want to make sure that you are the right person for this. 
I think over time, a, a reporter and those in the media will get to know you, that you are accurate. And then this was something that they'll learn over time. They'll, they'll say, hey, I've, I've gone to this person before. He's not steered me wrong. She's always given, given me good information. I'm going to call them first to do this interview because they're an expert in this particular medical field. So that's important to do, and it takes time. The next step is if you are approached and it's a green light <clears throat> for you to give this interview, uh, there's a few steps you want to take. Uh, again, I've emphasized this. They are so busy and there are other people out there that will you know, answer questions. You've got to really respond quickly. Personally, I try to get back to them in about 15 minutes. Um, I know that's how quickly they get their stories approved with their producer, that's how quick <clears throat> um, they have to be moving on with their day because they have to basically drive around, set things up, they have to have time to edit everything. And uh, I try to be as accommodating as possible. I'll meet them if that helps. Um, I'll put things in writing so it helps them with their script. I will try to find out a little bit of information because this is where I'm going to talk to you about risk. Some of these interviews can be dangerous. Some of these interviews, um, you want to really know what you're getting into. and. Sometimes you'll know that this is going to be a good story. Sometimes you know that this could be maybe not a good story, that this could be something a little dicey. <clears throat> so there's some questions you want to check. First, uh, obviously, let's find out, you know, what are we talking about? Or, you know, what's the general topic? And that is a fair question. You know, sometimes a reporter will say, I just want to talk to you. And you have every right to say, what do you want to talk to me about? So um, let me change that there. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, I think that some topics, they may be getting opinions from other people. And you have to realize that if they're asking me my opinion, let's say about vaccinations, it's fair for me to say, who else are you asking? Because you could sort of see, you may be pitted against somebody else with an opposing point of view. Because remember, the media is trying to tell the full story, maybe not in detail, but they're trying to tell both sides of the story on some stories. And so you may get this situation where you, you better know who else they're talking to. <clears throat> and, and that lets you know that maybe you need to explain things in a particular area in more detail and not just assume the media and the public will just agree with what you're saying. There could be an, an alternative point of view. Um, and now you want to present that clearly. Why do they call you to do the interview? Make sure you know that because they may be calling you because you're a particular employee or you're affected by this or you were the expert in the area, but you want to make sure you know how you fit in. Well, you would like to be able to review it yourself when it shows up, so you do want to ask them, when's this going to show up in print or on the radio or on TV? And you want to be able to look at it and say, did I do a good job? I never blame the media for something that comes out that didn't turn out well. Yeah, I feel it's my fault. If I didn't get it right, or if they didn't get it right, well, where did they get their information from? They got it from me. Uh, maybe I needed to be a little more clear on it. <clears throat> now, sometimes you, you can't really ask this question, but sometimes you'll get the feel for the reporter's opinion. Um, just the other day, we had a situation where um, a child brought their grandparents' diabetic supplies to the playground and it was in a bag and the child was hitting other kids with it. And these were used lancets and some people called them needles because they didn't know what they were exactly. They had bloody test strips in this bag. And the reporter who thought it was just a kid hitting another kid with a bag didn't know the full story and so really didn't think this was a big deal. However, there were other people who heard the full story was that the bag broke open, all these needles were spread over the playground and, of course, there's mulch on the playground, and so it was very hard to pick them up. So I needed to understand that the reporter was not understanding the big picture, and we didn't have all the information. So I wanted to be careful to say to the reporter, we're gathering more information. This may be more than what you understand. It helped me to understand the reporter's opinion ahead of time and, you know, helped me understand what needed to be done in this situation. Was we better make sure all those needles are picked up or we just completely remove all the mulch and replace it with new mulch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me give you an example of uh, tuberculosis. I want you to think of the disease tuberculosis. Now we had just had a tuberculosis day where you know sort of this is a you know a day of 
recognition for the disease. It's a big, big disease. It's a worldwide disease. For those of you who don't know, it, 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 it's one of the most common and one of the more deadly diseases out there in the world. Maybe not here in the United States, but in the world it causes a lot of problems. It's resistant to treatment. There's some problems with it. <coughs> and so um, we have that. But here in the United States, some people really are a little apathetic about it. You know, they don't hear about it. They don't care about it. It's not something they worry about. So uh, they say it's an old disease. It's no longer a problem. And they don't think about it. So here's that situation I started with. You got something where you may want to raise people's awareness and get them interested in it because it's still a problem in some areas of the United States. And then, um, you know, is that, is that the situation? Because I'll tell you, a reporter called me about tuberculosis. Um, so a reporter called me and said, can you just comment on tuberculosis? So with what I just described, think about how you would respond to this reporter's question. You know, here you are. You're a medical expert. You know, you, you've gone through school. You've gotten your training as a nurse, a you know, pharmacist, a medical student, doctor. You know tuberculosis. You know a little bit about it. You definitely know more than the reporter. Okay. So they just say, hey, I want to ask you a question. Do you mind doing a report? Inter interview. Could be a newspaper interview. Sure, I'll tell you about tuberculosis. So when they say, can you comment about it? What would you want to say? And so, you know, you might think, well, I, I, I just heard what, you know, this is a serious disease. You know, I know a little bit about it. There's people who's apathetic about it. We need to get people excited about it. You know, say, hey, this is still an issue, especially if you're traveling. If you're going on a missionary trip to uh, Haiti or, or other countries that have TB in it, you need to know about this. Well, go back to that rule I just sort of said a few minutes ago. What's going on here? What's the topic of this story? You know, is this, is this, is this something I should really know more about? And, uh, you know, that's the key question. You know, that's what I needed to try to find out. Now, I was a little bit on the lucky side. Um, I found out that this story was actually about an elephant, actually two elephants that were suffering from tuberculosis in my community. Apparently there is a, um, a person who has pet elephants, or are they taking, they're taking care of elephants, and they got infected with tuberculosis, which is sort of messy. You know, they have a lot of mucus coming out of their nose, and they're hard to treat because you've got to treat them with these gigantic suppositories of medication. So treating an elephant with tuberculosis is pretty tough. But now you could say, I'm glad I didn't answer the question the way I was going to. Because if I had said this is a deadly disease, it's, it's, a, it's a worldwide scourge, a lot of people die of the tuberculosis in other countries, that probably wouldn't have gone over well because these, uh, these are basically people would hear and say, hey, the, I've seen elephants, you know, uh, when I've taken my child to a circus, and, you know, do I want to worry about that? So this allowed me to say, you know, really for the audience that's going to view this story, what are the helpful facts? What are the facts about this that it will, you know, basically help people um, understand the situation. So I responded to the reporter, well, look, TB is treatable, and it's easily diagnosed, especially in this country, okay? Next, TB is only spread when you're really close to that infected organism, you know, often a human, but in this case an elephant, and you've got to be in that close contact day after day, hour after hour, not a few minutes in a circus tent that's an enormous circus tent, no. This is where, you know, you're driving in the same car, you're living in the same house, and, you know, TB is treatable and curable, and, you know, there's always an investigation that will help to find who's at risk, and it is okay. So you see how the story message changed because I had a better understanding of what the reporter was doing. Now, the reporter might have wanted me to say this is a deadly disease, and so according to Dr. So-and-so, this deadly disease is now in circus elephants. No, 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 that, that's a disservice. This is not very an accurate statement. So I think it was behooved me to make sure I understood the story better. Let me go to the next step. Some things you cannot ask as you're setting up the interview. You know, you really can't say, I need to know ahead of time every single question you're going to ask me. That, that's just not... <clears throat> That's just not, you know, done. You can try asking that, but um, there's some freedom that the reporter needs to be able to explore different things, and that's a warning to you to make sure you're ready for questions that they might think of based upon your answers. 
because your answers will lead to future questions. And you have to understand when you say something, you may be asked a follow-up question on that. So make sure you understand that. Um, you want to make sure you understand what the VVH is. And I use this as a mnemonic to re help me remember that every good story that's on television at least, or any good reading, the best, have these three ingredients. Not all stories, but think about it. You've seen stories where there has always been a victim. You know, think about it. Think about all the stories that you see in the paper. Obviously, many of them have victims. But often there's a villain, certainly. And the best stories have a hero that they can talk to about. They can say, look at this story. Something bad happened to somebody, and look who did it. This is the person that did it. And here's who came in to save the day. Now, sometimes the hero is the media. They, they, get the, you know, they revealed the story. Other times it could be you. Uh, but you want to make sure you're not the villain. Um, that... Um, that can happen sort of easily. I, I remember uh, there was a story many years ago at a, um, at a military hospital, and the story was they were interviewing a doctor, and uh, they were questioning him about prosthetic limbs, like, uh, you know, for an amputee, like a legs, and how expensive they were. And they were asking this physician who had a little trouble communicating, but they were saying, you know, how expensive is this? And, you know, these things were very expensive. And so the, the doctor was a little nervous, you know, not really comfortable about talking about the cost of things, but said, you know, you know they're, this is the cost of them. They were very expensive. And the reporter started asking questions like, well, how do you know folks deserve it? How do you know this is really necessary? And the, the doctor became a little defensive and said, well, we do a very slow process of double-checking things to make sure that, you know, this person is truly needing this device and, and, and try to see what the reporter was asking. And, and you can see the, how the questions were being answered. The, the doctor was saying, I'm, um, I know this is expensive, so we just, don't, we just don't give these prosthetics to anyone. We're very careful. Well, the real part of the story was actually about a very sad story of a man uh, who served this country, lost his legs, and was not able to get his prosthetics. It was taking months upon months upon months. So they told that when it came time to show the actual final product of the story, they showed the story of this poor man who couldn't get his prosthetics. And then they cut to <coughs> a, a physician basically trying to explain how expensive these things are and how people needed to wait for them. That was not very nice or fair because, it, it, again, the, the doctor didn't realize that he was being made out to be the villain and he really had no control over this particular patient. So this was a little, uh, I would think, not ethical, um, but when you watch the story's final product, it, it certainly gave a, a victim and a villain and here the media was the hero that was going to reveal how the hospital was slowing down the process of getting this person help and that things were going to happen a lot faster now. So be careful. You know the full part of the story. Also, you know, what is the in this story, what is the C, C, and C? Because again, not all stories have C, C, and C, although the good stories that get a lot of people reading them do. And C, C, C is, yes, this is the interesting stuff. This is the juicy stuff. They like to hear that there is some argument going on, that there is something that wasn't done right, that somebody is actually pointing it out and saying, Look how bad a job somebody is doing. And, you know, if that's the kind of story it's going to be, you've got to be real careful. Do you really want to do that story? Um, you may be stuck and you have to do it, but uh, other times you may see this coming from a mile away and you'll say, you know, you're not the best person to really get involved in this. And maybe it's not, you're not creating the controversy. They want you to comment on it. Maybe that's one you do want to steer clear of. You know, why do you want to comment on somebody else's argument? And often as experts in the health field, sometimes you get pulled into that. You don't really want to, and you can try to avoid it if possible. <coughs> me. Okay, next step. You're accepting the interview. Uh, you determine that, yes, you're the right person. Because sometimes you have to say, um, you know, I don't exactly treat that disease, but I know another doctor that does, or this is a nursing issue, and there's a, a nurse expert on this issue, or, a, or there's another person. So you want to make sure you're the right person. Also, very careful, if you work for somebody else, like you work for a hospital, you work for a university, you work for a company, have you notified your public information officer? 
This is a job duty of a particular person in many organizations. The PIO, Public Information Officer, they help you with the media. They organize media events, and sometimes they don't know that the media has contacted you. You really need to let them know. The, the things uh, go very badly if the, they don't know that you're talking to the media because they're the ones who might know somebody else was talking to the media and maybe had something different to say than you. And you really don't want to be contradicting what somebody else is saying in your organization. Well, if you've been called to do an interview and you've said, yes, I'll do it, I'm the right person, uh, everything is set up, uh, you don't want to start answering questions bad idea because you really want to prepare first. You just say, yep, I'll talk to you at 2 o'clock tomorrow or I'll talk to you in 30 minutes, um, but I need to take care of a few things. Um, I'll talk to you soon. And then you end the call because you don't want to start answering questions because that will be part of the interview. And you may say things off the cuff. You may say things in a joke and it will become part of the story. And you don't want to have that happen. All right, now <clears throat> let's get ready for this interview. Um, to get ready, uh, you want to pick a location. You know, if you're doing a television interview, what's going on in the background is important. You know, is, is it a noisy area? But you know, some interviews, they're done at a person's desk. That may not be a good idea. It may make you look like you're somewhat removed from a situation. However, if you are an authoritative, authoritative figure is what you're trying to you know, display, then that might be the, the right place to be. Um, if you're doing a health story, you know, maybe your location would be in the clinic. If you're doing something about the health and the environment, maybe you want to be outside, um, taking into account the, the heat and temperature and all that. So the location is important, you know, uh, you know, a cluttered desk versus a very neat desk. Um, you know, each has its own meaning and you need to think about that and what really fits with it. Um, you may want to have your logo behind you. So uh, we usually have logos throughout our building inside and out and so we can we can have this uh, in the background of a shot and then, then they appreciate that. Um, if you're doing a interview for the newspaper, it's nice to do it on the phone because on the phone you can look at your notes, you can refer to emails and look at your computer, you can even look things up on the internet and Google something if you're trying to get through some particular topic. Um, sometimes when a newspaper reporter wants to actually sit down with you and meet with you, that you start to wonder, you know, why? You know, because it can be done over the phone. Maybe they want to look at your reaction. Maybe they want to see how you, you respond. What's your body language? So take that into account uh, if they choose a location to be in person. Radio interviews are often done over the phone nowadays. And uh, those are tape recorded. And be cautious when doing a radio interview. They, they flip on the record switch fairly quickly. They usually tell you that they're doing this, but that's their recording. Um, and some will be live um, and um, in that situation. Others are taped and will be edited. What you've got on is what the people will see. And I suggest that, you know, of course, wearing something white will look wrinkled. It will have shadows in it. Uh, it looks sort of sloppy, so white things tend to not do as well. Uh, however, if you're trying to get a point across that you're a health professional, wearing a white coat is probably the, uh, an option to consider. Uh, maybe draping a stethoscope over your neck uh, to make it clear that you're talking about something medical. However, do not have a lot of things around your face, like a pin on your lapel, or a lot of things in your pocket, like pens, uh, uh, pens and contraptions that doctors tend to carry around, you know, a tie that has often got a lot of, you know, uh, noticeable designs. And here's the reason why. On TV, for instance, you only have about nine seconds to get your message across. You don't want the viewers looking at your lapel pin or your tie or that crazy outfit you're wearing. You want them to look at your lips. There'll be distractions in that nine seconds. You know, they're going to put your name down at the bottom with your title and they're going to glance down at that. But you want them to glance right back up at your mouth or look at your eyes and see that you're communicating to the reporter. By the way, you don't look in the camera, but you know they'll see you're, you're making a point. You want to have them look at you. So what the wear is important. Um, the background, you know, always double check this because um, if you're doing a newspaper interview and they're going to take a photograph, uh, I'll give you an example of a case I had where a reporter was emphasizing how to stop smoking. So I had asked a patient to come in 
And I told the reporter, I said, you know, the one thing I do is I give the stethoscope to the patient, and I have the patient listen to my lungs, and then I have them listen to their lungs. And this is very effective if they've got ronchi or wheezing. It, actually, they've never heard their own lungs sometimes. It really surprises them. You know, I said, you know, this is something you can help. You can get better. It's, there's a, things you can do um, when it comes to, you know, addressing how to stop smoking. And it makes a pretty good point. Well, anyway, that was the photograph they took. Unfortunately, I did not look behind me because right above the patient's head in the photograph on the wall behind us was a big poster in my clinic that said, sexually transmitted diseases. Well, that was awkward, you know, and, and of course, the, you know, I apologize for this. And the patient understood that, you know, this was a medical clinic. There's signs like that, and uh, people wouldn't really notice or make the connection. But, you know, it bothered me. And I always look behind me now to make sure, you know, there isn't something embarrassing behind me. Um, here's examples, just as you can see I, uh, on the, the couple of the um, pictures here. I've got my logo behind me. However, the upper left-hand corner... That to me is distracting. You know, there's multiple colors, and actually the word says SWAT, S-W-A-T. Um, and so that could be confusing because I wasn't talking about SWAT, which, you know, of course has the police you know, connection, but here it's actually students working against tobacco, SWAT. Um, but it was irrelevant and it was distracting. Uh, bottom right, you can see why well, I've got the stethoscope there, um, probably a little look of consternation, but, um, you know, it's, I'm talking about a medical issue. Um, Next, you want to go with the reporter ahead of time and try when you, you know, educate what you can because they're going to have to do a lead-in to the story, which, you know, sort of describes the story. They're going to have to provide information to the anchors, and the anchors have to describe, you know, what the story is about. That comes from you. So if you can teach the reporter, even given something in writing, that's, you know, safe, you know, some notes, that's going to be very helpful. But you don't want to be getting into a big teaching conversation during the interview. It, you're going to lose the reporter. You're going to be quoted out of context because there's no way they can get all that at one time. And here's an example of me just, I'm doing that. He's looking at my notes. He's going to be using that to help ask me the right questions because I wanted him to ask me certain questions about the topic. Ahead of time, as after I've set up the interview, I pulled out a piece of paper called my um, SOCO. And as you can see, that this is what my number one communication issue is going to be. In other words, when that person puts down the newspaper after reading the newspaper article or turns off the TV and walks away, what is the one thing that's going to be in their mind from the story? What do I want to get across? And it helps very much to write this down ahead of time. You don't have to memorize it. Just make sure you know it, and you can say it in different ways. That means you're staying on message. You can, you can make sure you're communicating what you want to communicate, not what the reporter wants you to communicate. Um, we did a story on rabies. A bat fell into the head of a student and got caught in her hair at school. The, the bat was knocked away, uh, but kids picked it up. They petted it, and kids needed to get the vaccination. Well, the reporter wanted to ask me, what's the worst that can happen with an exposure to rabies? Now, I knew if I said you could die, that was going to be the quote they would use from me in the paper or on television. So I wasn't going to say that. I said the worst that can happen is that you could be exposed to this disease in a country that doesn't have good health care and good public health and not know how to handle this. But here is, you know, we don't have the worst happening here. This person got... Um, the bat tested to see if it was rapid, which it was, and got the preventative treatment. And so we're not going to see anything bad happen. And I just refused to answer that question. He could, he could say it himself. He could look it up and see what the worst of rabies is. But I wasn't going to be caught on record saying you could die because that wasn't going to be a part of the story. I didn't want to you know, why alarm and scare people unnecessarily. But I did say rabies is a serious disease. That's why we have... Um, animal control and the health department working to protect people. That's my main message. I only wanted to be caught saying that. And the reporter got a little upset. He wanted me to say, you can die. And like, in fact, he turned the mic off and said, why aren't you saying that? I said, that's not my main message. My main message is where you can help people exposed to this serious disease. And it involves a vaccination. It involves education. Um, if he wants to say you can die, he can do that. And that's what he did in his story. He said rabies is a fatal disease. And then he had 
my comment being that we're here to help people. <clears throat> and that's what doctors and nurses do. You have to remember this when giving a interview. You are providing the information and not the reporter. You want to make sure you get your message across and that's you're here to help. All right, so you want to be, again, this is, I knew this was coming. So this gets to my next slide is you have to realize you're going to get asked questions that you may not want to be asked. But if you ignore it, which that's human tendency to ignore things that could happen badly, um, they will happen and you will not be prepared. So prepare the responses to the simple questions and realize every time you say something, it could lead to another question. You need to think of what those questions would be before you say it. So every interview has these problems some of these can be very explosive issues so make sure you you know well what if they ask this what if they ask that how am I going to respond and make sure you feel comfortable giving those answers and the questions that follow make sure you have the answers to those too um, here's an example I want you to think about you're the one that's going to answer this question okay so you need to think about this there's a hurricane that's hit your community and you have people housed actually thousands of people are housed in shelters and you are in charge of these shelters. You are the one that uh, makes sure that these shelters are running properly. People have to have the right food to eat. They have to have bathrooms, lighting, places to sleep, medical attention if need be. Okay, well, in these shelters, by coincidence, there happens to be uh, somebody who is just uh, leaving a, um, well, he, he was a drug addict and off heroin. Um, and I mention that because when you stop taking um, narcotics like heroin and morphine, uh, they, those drugs normally cause constipation. So what do you think happens when you stop taking your heroin and your morphine? You get diarrhea. Okay. Now there was also in the same shelter, there was also a young woman who, for whatever reason, took a little too much X-lax. There was another person who, they just have irritable bowel and certainly with, um, this is a disorder that, uh, uh, during a hurricane when you don't know where your pets are, you don't know what's going on, you know, your irritable bowel could flare up and it's uh, just from that. And then, um, you know, you put this together and people talk and you overhear things and you're in a crowded shelter and you, you know, you, people are going in and out of the bathroom, you can hear people going to the bathroom. And you can imagine this all adds up to one thing. Obviously there's an outbreak of dysentery in, the, in, the, in this shelter. That's not good. You can see where this could be a very ugly situation when people think that there's an outbreak of a, of, of, a, of a word. Okay, This is a word that people don't even probably know what the meaning of is in some ways, but it just sounds bad. And uh, again, those who do know the meaning of it, that's not good either. So this is what actually happened. People started to spread the rumor. In fact, it got on the EMS radio that uh, somebody called EMS, and then of course, who listens to EMS radios? people with police scanners like the media so the media comes up to you and says to you we heard there's an outbreak of dysentery in your shelter what are you going to say so think about your response you know um, I think you know I've given you the facts that you know and I think the response could be one that you could formulate. So think about that for a second. You know, you're you're sort of in charge in keeping everything calm. You're also in charge of giving information to the media. And the media comes up to you as you're walking into the shelter and says, I heard there's an outbreak of dysentery in the shelter. Is it true? How do you respond? Okay. So you may want to pause the tape and, and think about it and maybe jot down your notes because it's not as simple as you think. Now the obvious answer would be no there's not. Right? You know, reporter asks you, is there a dysentery outbreak in this shelter? Your answer, no there's not. That isn't going to do it because whenever somebody presents you with something negative, something scary, something bad, you know, something negative, and you respond with something positive, how do you think the public is going to weigh that in their mind? Hmm, let's see. On the one hand, there's possibly something serious. There's this rumor of dysentery. And then there's this guy saying, no, there's not. Yes, he's the spokesperson for the health agency. But you know what? Human nature is to play it safe. 
you're going to be a little worried about still, hey, they still said there was this dysentery outbreak in the shelter, and my family's in that shelter, and there's a thousand people in there. And, hmm, and this, all I've heard is this one guy just say, no, there's not. So you cannot answer this question by simply saying, no, there's not. There's an old rule in communication that says for every negative, or excuse me, to equal a negative, you have to give three positives. Just to equal that one negative, you have to provide three positives in order to get the general public to say, okay, I'm beginning to understand that maybe there's not um, this bad thing on there because with only one positive, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the side of comfort and say, yep, there's a dysentery outbreak there and I'm going to tell 10 other people. But if somebody showed you three things that were positive and opposing the one negative, you'll say, yeah, okay, uh, maybe not. Maybe this is not true. You give four things that are positive, the people will be convinced, you know, for the most part. But it depends on what you say. What you say has to be truthful, it has to be accurate, it has to be understandable. So here we go. Three, uh, three positives equals one negative. Um, is there dysentery outbreak in this shelter? Well, no. That's my one. We already said that. No, there's no reports of any unusual illnesses here. Because those, those three that we had, uh, an addict, which is a sort of a personal, private issue, the person who took Axlax, the person with irritable bowel, that's a personal medical thing. Those are private, you know, uh, sort of you can consider them HIPAA protected. No, there's nothing of public health importance going on in this shelter. There is no dysentery outbreak. Two, but you know what? Whenever we hear of a concern, we investigate anyone who may be ill. And we find out what it is. So if there was somebody who might have not been feeling well, we find out. We find out if it's something that needs to be addressed. Could it spread you know, through uh, the public? Is it contagious? We have not found anything like that, but we look into it. Every time we hear a report, we find out the facts. And I can tell you, we've investigated any kind of report like that, and there is nothing that's been contagious. Um, so we're, we're assured there. You know what? Also, um, just to be careful, since we are in a shelter, we make sure the food is safe every day. In fact, they use food in shelter that you really can't mess it up. You know, it's the kind of food that you, it doesn't spoil very easily. But we make sure it's stored properly, cooked properly, served properly, and, and disposed of properly. So I can reassure you that to catch dysentery from the food in here, that's not possible either. We make sure the water is safe. We make sure there's soap and uh, places to wash your hands. So again, it makes it very unlikely. And, and as I tell you, there, there's not a dysentery outbreak here. But you know what, number four, I'll tell you what, if there was, I would tell you immediately. Because something like that, people need to know if it was true. Okay, think about it. If you were the doubting public, if you were a cynic, and you tended not to believe what you were told, do you think you might believe that there's not a dysentery outbreak at the shelter? I think so. I think there's enough information that the average person and even, even the most suspicious person would say, okay. And you know that reporter? I, he walked away saying, thank you very much. One less story I have to write about. And it became what we call, we quashed it. There was no story. And, you know, and, and soon people discovered that you know, there was no dysentery outbreak. And we moved on. All right, so the next step. Now we get to get to the actual interview. Um, let me show you sort of, uh, we, we prepared for the interview, we prepared our questions, we prepared what we're going to say. And sometimes you do worry, you know, is this the media? You know, sometimes we say you got to feed this bear, you know, the, the information that can be sort of ugly. However, you, you just got to be ready. You need to know what to do. Um, you need to know how to um, <clears throat> present yourself. Uh, I'll start first with posture. If you're uh, seated uh, for the interview, even if you're, you're just uh, off camera, if you're just talking to a reporter, you want to look engaged. You want to sit forward in your seat. You want to lean forward slightly. Have your hands visible up on the desk. Um, you know, keep your gestures calm. Try not to move your hands up to your face. Never touch your face. Just, you know, try not to. I mean, it is, uh, it is sort of a rule that in very important things, uh, like in a press conference, you really don't want to be touching your face. Uh, it just, it, it's just not needed. It tends to send a wrong signal. Um, but you know, you do want to use your hands when you're making a specific point. I use my hands way too much. However, uh, if I need to try to tone it down, I try to save them for a particular point. 
and you have good eye contact, not into the camera, but with, um, you know, with uh, the person you're talking to. So that's important. If you're standing up, um, you don't want to really uh, fold your hands behind your back. We call this the convict. It makes you look like you got handcuffs on behind your back uh, as a sort of a joke. Um, we don't want to fold your hands in front of yourself. We call this the fig leaf. It's like you're, you're hiding your groin, and that doesn't look as good either. Um, you want to have your hands natural, just at your side. Um, try not to have both of them in your pocket. Uh, and, you know, some people just like to see your hands. I mean, folks, if I'm, if I'm talking to a group of law enforcement folks, they may know who I am, but just in their in their gut, they would like to see my hands. It's just what's, that's what they do for a living. They need to look at people and assess the situation. And if I'm just talking to them friendly, it helps me to have them have them see that my there's nothing in my hands, um, so I know my audience. I think I've emphasized this next issue is when you're doing the interview. Remember what you're there for. You're there for your point. You're not there to present the other point. Maybe you find the whole situation interesting. You like to maybe even argue with yourself about what the main story is. Don't do this with the reporter. Don't point out what the other side is. I mean, you, you've got your message to share. You, you, you believe in it. Um, stick to that. All right, so now the interview starts. Realize that when you're talking with a reporter, radio, newspaper, pen and pencil, or a camera, you're always on and they're recording everything, whether they write it down or not. Uh, if you say a joke and it's sort of cute, chances are it could, be, it could appear in the newspaper story. You know, I talk about mosquitoes. You know, the mosquitoes are really bad, but the ones that carry disease are the ones that bite at dusk and dawn, and they're very timid. But the mosquitoes that come out during daytime, they tend not to carry disease, but they're big mosquitoes. They'll knock you down and take your wallet. Well, you know, that's a cute little statement. Well, that shows up in the newspaper, and, you know, I have to realize if I say it, it could end up in the newspaper. And do you really want to read that? Uh, you know, personally, I didn't, but I have to realize that that shows up. Now, they'll clip a mic to you if you're doing a television interview, and they maybe tuck it under your shirt, whatever. And sometimes they'll, they'll uh, finish the interview, and they'll set the camera down and point it away from you. And, uh, you know, the reporter and you might continue the conversation. That's being recorded. In fact, with the wireless mics, I had an employee who walked into a break room with the reporter and told them something that was just some kind of rumored story. And, you know, that was still being recorded. The, the, the video camera was in the next room. It was still running. And it was recording the conversation. Nothing bad happened, but it was just like something to learn about that. Also, after the, uh, the interview, normally, well, during the interview, the camera is usually facing you, and the reporter is the person you're looking at, and the, the camera will be behind the reporter. To complete the story, after the interview is over, they'll tell you to stay where you are, and the camera, they'll, they'll actually take off the microphone sometimes, and they'll walk around you, and they'll take pictures of you and the reporter just standing there. They'll take a picture from behind you, of your back. So uh, the thing with that is, keep in mind that um, at this point, the microphone's off. The interview is theoretically over. However, the reporter might be asking you about your kids, uh, the weather, um, the funny movie they saw last night. And if you're talking about somebody who's died, or uh, we had an employee talking about the closing down of a mobile home park, and a lot of people had to be evicted. And uh, the, the one thing, he was wearing a three-piece suit, which was not the kind of clothes to be wearing on that kind of interview. But he was also, during this part of the interview, joking about his kids, laughing about it. And, you know, that didn't look right. You know, you know here they are laughing it up. You couldn't see the reporter laughing, but you could see this guy laughing without any sound. So you had no idea what they were laughing about. So the, re the interview is going to be from start to finish. You've got to be on the entire time. Remember your topic and treat it appropriately. If it's something that requires empathy and you, you really feel sorry for the people involved, if it's been a, a death or a, a sickness, you know, that's the kind of uh, behavior you need to keep. You want to avoid saying something that really makes the reporter suspicious. Why can't you comment? Is there something you're hiding? You, you're sort of digging yourself a hole as soon as you say no comment. So before the interview started, you need to figure a way to answer these questions without saying, I can't comment on that, because that doesn't fly. It doesn't work in the long run. So just remember, what can you do to avoid that? Now, if you want to guarantee getting on the news that night, hit the camera, touch the camera, jostle it, because you know when you, when you touch the camera, 
it shakes the whole thing, and it looks very violent. So, I mean, if you were getting bugged or worst case scenario, if you're in a bad interview and you don't want to be in that interview, the last thing you want to do is walk away and then bump into the camera or the cameraman because that just shows something very interesting that the general public would love to see. Um, if you're trying to get out of an interview, you basically you're be nice, you smile, and you, you explain that you know uh, you have another appointment. You you know we were finished with the interview, and you have to be very pleasant because everything you say will be shown if it's outrageous enough. And certainly touching the camera that will that will do it every time. So if you ever hope I hope you never find yourself in this kind of situation where you're in an interview where you're starting to get a little upset. But if you do, remember that don't do that. Okay, um, so remember, you want to um, remember what you're there about and always start off with mentioning if it's a health story, you're here to help people, you're worried about people's safety, you want to make sure that um, you care. You know, this is something that you do every day, you, you care about people all the time. Make sure you mention it when you're doing an interview. You, you know, you're all empathetic, you can understand what it could be like to lose somebody. Maybe you haven't had this happen yourself, but you can understand how serious this can be and you empathize. So always say that. Um, we know not to do this. Uh, you know, the reporters will say, do you know, do you think, what do you think, what's your guess? They will bug you to give you a number. I, I mean, if, if you say, I don't know how much it costs. Well, how much do you think it costs will be the question. And if you say, I, I don't know, I say, well, just give a ballpark figure. And as soon as you say, I don't know, 212000 know, or 200000 that will be the quote in the paper. They'll say, according to Dr. So-and-so, the, the cost could be around 200000 Well, if you're way off, there's no excuses. You, you said the number, and they're not going to put in all the hemming and hawing about how you, you don't know. As soon as you say the number, you own it. So be careful what you say. As soon as you say something, it's yours. You own it. Um, you maybe have heard this before. It doesn't exist. Um, you know, reporters will say to speak off the record, but you have to be in mind that that really isn't true. You say something off the record, they will uh, come back to it later. They'll ask you about it and see what happens. Um, we as doctors and nurses and others tend to use acronyms and we get so used to them. Everybody must know what the ICU is. Well, no. They don't know that's the intensive care unit, so just don't even bother using an acronym, but you have to catch yourself doing this. And that's why it's good to, you know, go through these questions before the interview. Always try to remember to be just like you're talking to a friend. Be, how would you talk to a spouse that's, uh, or a family member that's not medical? Um, an important thing is if you really don't know, it's fine to say this. However, it's like I did with the three positives equals one negative, you just can't say, I don't know. Why don't you say, I don't know, here's why I don't know, and here's what I'm going to do about it. Those are three things that the average person will forgive you for not knowing the answer if you're supposedly a health expert. So the average person will say, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. So you can't say it all the time, but as long as you say why you don't know it and what you're going to do about it. Like, I'm going to get that, I don't know it because that information is still being calculated. And as soon as I find out, I will let you know what it is. Um, a trick that the reporters will do, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it here, you won't be able to see this, but if, if a reporter has a microphone in his hand, they will have the microphone near their mouth when they're talking, and then they'll put the microphone up to your mouth when you're talking. Well, when you finish answering the question, some reporters keep the microphone at your mouth. They don't take it back like they were doing before, because it was back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes they'll just stop and keep it at your mouth. Nobody uh, likes silence, and there's this little cue of, hey, I've got the microphone at your mouth. Maybe you have more to say. Well, the reporter does this sometimes on purpose because you know, chances are you might say something and possibly you might say something you really didn't want to say. You got to be really comfortable in not saying anything. If you're done talking, you stop talking and you just smile. And as long as they want to keep that microphone in front of your mouth, you just let them. And uh, you wait. They will cut this out of the video. They will edit that out. And eventually they'll remove the microphone. 
Uh, some of the more famous reporters uh, that are on television now, that they, they use that technique, not with a microphone, but they, they're just silent. You know, they'll just sit there and look at you, and they'll just sort of wait for you to start talking again. And sure enough, you might say something you didn't want to say, and that will lead to more questions that maybe you weren't prepared to answer. Um, so don't fill the void. You want to be short and simple. And there's a mnemonic here, um, or a, a thing to remember, 3927. It turns out that in television and in newspapers, they only have time for about nine seconds. You might have just nine seconds to get your point across. In normal speech, it takes about nine seconds to say 27 words. In the way I'm talking right now, I can say 27 words in nine seconds. And you could understood what I said. If I'm from New York, you might talk like this. You might not be able to do it. Right 35 minutes. You might get 35 words in there. But that is not intelligible. Clear communication done a little fast. You can get nine, 27 words in nine seconds. It turns out you can get three separate points made in 27 words. That is sort of a goal. If you're going to answer a question, you don't want to go on for 45 seconds. You don't want to try to get in five points. Get in two or three points. You can do it in nine seconds. Let me show you an example um, on a video here. This is a story about the tsunami from a few years ago, the one that hit Southeast Asia. It's a story of a um, local physician who is from Thailand, and she has family over there that was affected, and she's going to tell the story on how this affected her. But she'll get to a, um, a couple of sound bites. Now, she had a few sound bites in here that were 27 seconds. I'm going to focus at one that comes a little later. Also, um, this is a good example of what we've already talked about. You will see where she taught the reporter ahead of time in groups of threes what to look out for if you are going to a tsunami area to help people in need. If you're going to be on a missionary trip, here are things that you need to know. And you can see we taught the reporter ahead of time because the text on the screen basically came from uh, us at the health department. Mentioned, type in charity check. With the tragedy that already exists, another major concern right now in those areas that have been hit the hardest is the threat of disease among those people who have survived yeah. this terrible event. Millions of people could face infection, even death, because of food and waterborne illnesses. Tonight, that is especially alarming to a local doctor who's not only an expert in infectious diseases, but also has a unique connection to the tsunami-ravaged region. Jennifer Lee continues our 8 on Your Side team coverage. As the pictures of devastation in Southeast Asia become more clear and the death toll rises, Worries now intensify for those survivors left dealing with the disaster. In addition to a ravaged landscape, they now face the threat of disease and injury. The water also has problems. Though. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Chararat Sumbawit works at the Polk County Health Department. Her heart is with friends and family in her home country of Thailand, one of the areas hit by the tsunami. I cannot really count how, how many embraces I got in the past week, how many cards I received. Actually, I, I will send those cards to my family. And Her concern, though, is with the millions of survivors throughout Southeast Asia who now face some very real dangers. Dr. Sumbawin says water and foodborne illnesses like cholera, typhoid fever, and hepatitis A pose the greatest risk since so many survivors may not have access to clean water supplies or properly cooked food. She says vast flooding will likely cause standing water, ultimately leading to mosquito-borne illnesses like malaria and encephalitis. And the massive amounts of debris will undoubtedly result in injuries that untreated could become infected. They're problems that are drawing attention and assistance from around the globe. But Dr. Sumbawit cautions good Samaritan travelers could become victims too. It is very noble for Americans think to offer help to those area but it is very important for those people who would like to go out and help really consider to stay safe try not getting sick over there and don't bring any diseases home she says most diseases threatening the region are preventable in the best of conditions the reality makes it far more challenging in polk county i'm jennifer lee news channel eight in response to the growing need for medical help in the region, the Pentagon is sending a 1,000-bed hospital ship 
to Southeast Asia to help with the relief efforts. And I went on the Centers for Disease Control website tonight. It thoroughly explains the dangers of the aftermath for those folks there. If you want more information about what health risk survivors are facing, you can go to TBO.com under links we mentioned. Click on Centers for Disease Control. So she made those, those were three to four points. She made it in 27 seconds. And when they had a long conversation, their conversation was probably an hour. But, you know, that was all on film. The reporter had to really boil it down to something that her editors were, would allow on the news. And so they needed a nine-second clip here and there to make the story happen. And that was, uh, that was what uh, Dr. Sambunwit was able to do. Um, so here was the soundbite. She did it in threes. You remember, she, she also taught the reporter. So you saw this on a couple of slides that there were these three things that came up. And in fact, uh, when she mentioned uh, dangers with drinking water and flooding, she gave three examples, you know, like typhoid fever and hepatitis A and the other one. Um, she was empathetic and she used the 3927 rule for that last soundbite. And here it is. It's very noble for Americans to offer assistance. But to stay healthy, it's important for those helping to remain safe, don't get sick, and don't bring illnesses home. That is exactly 27 words and takes nine seconds to say. Now, here's an issue of <clears throat> when you're asked something that's a little negative, and this can still be a friendly interview on something that is what we call an evergreen story, something that is just a good news story, but obviously stories that are more controversial will have this in it. You can always be asked a negative question. Very important, don't say the negative uh, language. Um, for example, remember that example I gave you about the uh, dysentery outbreak in the hurricane shelter? If the reporter on television came up to me and said, is there a dysentery outbreak in this shelter? Very important for me not to use the words outbreak or dysentery. There wasn't an outbreak, there wasn't any dysentery, but as soon as I say those words, I own those words. They won't show the reporter saying the words. They will show me denying those words. And denying those words, as we've seen in the media here recently, of uh, some of the, the politicians and such, you, when you start saying the words, all people hear is, hey, did that guy say dysentery outbreak? So I will not say, no, there's no dysentery outbreak. Um, I think back when uh, they were spraying for uh, something, I think I remember some, some professional on television was asked, um, are you just experimenting with our children? No, I'm not experimenting with your children. You know, the answer obviously was no, but it's still, to say the words, you don't want to use that. You want to tell your side of the story. You want to make sure um, you focus on that uh, and, and tell a positive story. Um, and, and when you get asked a negative question, uh, like um, uh, something that is not what you were planning on saying, uh, you can say, um, um, you know, isn't this vaccine, um, you know, rumored to cause uh, mental retardation? Well, that was in the media recently. You would not say this, this vaccine does, it does not cause mental retardation. You know, you, this is some way off. You'd say this, you know, say, no, what's more important is that this vaccine helps prevent uh, cancer in the case of human papillomavirus. You would say, well, well, however, the real issue here is not what is rumored to happen in one particular person, but what is known to happen for a fact in thousands and thousands of people is that cancer can be prevented by the recipients of this vaccine. So I use these bridging statements. If I get asked a negative question that's not a part of my message, is I will bridge using these uh, kinds of comments <clears throat> to, um, to get to what is more important for the community to hear. Um, for example, do you think your hospital failed when this patient died of an infection they caught while in your hospital? Well, remember the rule, I would not say, I would not say, we didn't fail. You know, I'm not gonna get defensive. Uh, you, know, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not gonna get defensive. I'm not gonna repeat the negative language. If you want to pause and, you know, this tape and try to come up with your own answer, do so now. Here's um, a response, if you knew that that was going to be the question coming up, is to say, look, our condolences go out to the family, and that's the truth. Uh, we're very sad to hear this, and, and this is a statement of empathy, and our condolences go out to the family. But what's more important to know, so here's my bridging statement, what's more important to know is, guess what? 
follows is probably 27 words and is taking me about nine seconds to say, you know what, this week our hospital saved lives of people with dangerous infections. So um, let me close, this will be my last example. Um, and I want you to pretend that you are in charge of this health program. Now you know some facts about the flu and part of your job is try to reduce the flu and you know the shots do help. There's other things that reduce the spread of flu but shots are one of them. And we know that this has always troubled the health community. You know, let alone doctors and nurses tend not to get flu shots enough. The general public tends not to get them and we, we wish more people got them. We also know, especially in the elderly, especially, and listen to this carefully, the elderly who are poor <clears throat> often don't get enough flu shots. So that's a big problem. And we combine those two, you know, you know there's places in your community where folks just don't have access to flu shots. Um, you wish there were more. Um, and often those, there's a uh, diversity issue where those who are minorities are not getting access to the flu shot. Okay, so you know this as a health professional. Most of you already knew this already. So that's something that you know. Okay, let me introduce that you have also now been able to uh, win an award. The award was financial support in a program called Vote and Vaccinate. On election day, you will be able to provide at certain precincts flu shots to people who are there. Now, this was a national program, and this is a true story. It was uh, available in 25 counties in the nation. So you were pretty lucky to get one of these. Uh, there was one in Texas and a couple in Florida. So you're one of these counties. Now, it only pays for like seven or eight precincts to have the vaccine staff, because this is really paying for the people giving the shot. And you, uh, excuse me, 11 precincts in our example. So you're, you're setting up these 11 precincts. Now, I want you to think as a program designer, which precincts would you choose, given that you have certain facts about the flu that you already know about, okay? So I'm thinking you're, you're thinking that, okay, well, this is in uh, the elderly and, and you know, the, uh, the poor and, and uh, minority groups. And in fact, you can go to the uh, supervisor of elections and you can find uh, sort of the demographics of age as such, uh, um, you know, where the precincts are, where to go to. So you picked, you picked the precincts that are going to make the biggest impact in the flu, age, poverty, and race. Okay, here is the real example. Reporter calls you, and they heard about this program, <clears throat> and they want to do an interview. Okay, so they've got some questions. Now, the questions you always prepare for is they're going to ask you, what are you doing? Well, if you want to pause the tape here and see if you can answer these questions. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And who are you reaching out to? So pause the tape now if you want and answer those questions. And we're back. So we say, okay, what are you doing? Well, I think the answer would be, well, we're getting flu shots out there to people who might have trouble getting it. We thought this would um, be a place where folks can go and you're um, um, doing this at the voting precincts on election day. It was a good combination. Why? Because there's folks that don't have access and who you're reaching out to and all that. Okay, so let, me, so let me just pretend that you are giving this interview right now and you've answered those questions. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready? Okay, so my next question is, why are you trying to influence the outcome of the election? Huh? Well, you, you are apparently influencing the outcome of the election because when you look at the precincts you've chosen, <clears throat> you've chosen precincts that are predominantly democratic. Poor, minority, this is, uh, so, so how is it that you are influencing the outcome of the election by drawing people to the ballot box with these flu shots? Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that I believe this. I mean, this was the real question. This actually happened in Texas. Um, we realized this is going to be a qu an answer. We realized that this was going to be a negative issue, right? One big whopping negative issue that we didn't prepare for. So the response has to take into account, well, what would be your normal reaction if this was your program, you planned it, you worked hard to get it set up, and you thought you were doing something really good, and then somebody comes along and asks this kind of question. Your normal response was, we're not trying to influence the outcome of the election. 
well, now you, you repeated the negative language. <laughs> you know, that's not good. Now you sort of, you're denying it on television now. That's not good. And, um, geez, uh, you've only said one thing. I think people are going to be a little suspicious here. So you've got to think, well, did you prepare for this? Look, this is the answer, and this is the way it was handled. We're trying to prevent the flu. We're trying to prevent the flu, and that's what's most important. We chose uh, precincts that had the highest rate of flu, and this uh, is all that's going to be accomplished here. This is not going to have uh, any untoward impact. In fact, the most important thing, bridging, bridging statement, the most important thing here is that we try to get the flu shot into as many people as possible. Now, we did know this ahead of time. In Texas, they actually had to cancel the vote and vaccinate because of the controversy. In our county, we pretty much uh, made it known that you did not have to vote to get the vaccine, okay? And the vaccine was not free, so there wasn't really a lure into that. So we wanted to make that point clear, which wasn't made clear in other communities. This, you know, you still had to pay for the vaccine. We were not in the voting precinct. There was a, you know, there's a rules against that. So we were out in the parking lot, so many feet away, and you did not have to vote at that precinct. You could have voted at another precinct. You didn't even have to vote at all. But we were there to be a convenient spot. So if you were in the inner city, uh, there were a lot of office workers that could have come down and got their, their vaccination. And there were others uh, there. So we talked to the medical director of the media outlet uh, and explained that. And it was actually a physician in charge of this. And uh, she understood. She understood that this was not part of the story. So the original question that we were asked, which was, why are you trying to influence this? That was never asked on camera. And it was not a part of the story um, when it came time to, um, uh, when it came time to uh, do it. So let me just show you uh, how the story did turn out. And again, we may have the same video problem. <clears throat> Okay, technical difficulties get us again. So up here, you'll pretty much you saw they 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 got right down to it, and this is a spokesperson for the health department who said, "Hey, we're here to help. We're trying to make sure we're stopping the flu, and we're educating people, and and you know, bring more people in. If you couldn't get the flu shot, get uh, get it somewhere else." And here is a reporter, and this is the reporter actually getting the flu shot uh, right there. So let me close out of that and bring back the presentation and um, just do that and end the program. I wish uh, you all much luck. Always get advice if you find yourself getting involved in an interview. Make sure you're the right person. You've got your message set ahead of time. Make sure your public information officer knows and you speak slowly and clearly. Make sure uh, you can always pause before answering a question. And again, you know, reviewing this information um, is helpful. There's a lot of information and advice out there, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much.